it's January, but it's very good to be here again. Second year running, terribly kind of you to invite me back. Um, delighted to see lots of old friends and all well enthusiasts, particularly delighted to meet David Ryan, whose book on all on screen I cannot recommend highly enough. Um, wonderful piece of work and research about which we will happily discussing over lunch and we'll probably do it subsequently. Uh, it's a bit, uh, this is a bit shameless by sticking, standing up here and addressing you because it's a, it's a shameless piece of self-advertising and promotion. Uh, in fact, I have a book out later this year which is simply called Lost Girls, subtitled Love, War and Literature, 1939 to 1951. And it's, uh, it, it's um, I suppose in talking about it to you, um, I need to answer two questions, which is one, who were the Lost Girls, and second, what was Orwell's connection with them? Well, the Lost Girls were a group, a tiny, tiny part of the wartime and subsequently demographic, uh, defined by Peter Cornell, um, who uh, in his, one of his volumes, one of his labyrinthian volumes of memoirs, of which he beguiled in his old age, uh, wrote about uh, his own rather relative career in wartime London, but he was a great friend of Sir Connolly's and in fact lived the same, lived in the attic upstairs in Connolly's flat in the early 1940s, and so it was party to the work of Horizon and its contributors for a great many years. And Cornell defined the Lost Girls as this very small but fascinating sociologically group, a rather rackety and flighty, well, mostly rather well-born, what we would call posh girls, I suppose, these days, who racketed around literary London during the war and were defined by ethos, by their separateness, by their waywardness, by the fact that they existed on the fringe. They were usually either estranged or detached from their families in some ways. They were usually highly intelligent, but they hadn't been properly educated because, as you can imagine, very few young women went to university in the early 1940s. And he talks, Quinnell in his memoir, Quinnell was associated with several of them, which I'll get on to in a moment. And Cornell talks to them about the, the way in which they kind of wandered in a very lonely way around wartime London, settling on any particular perch that caught their fancy, as, as he puts it. And um, the names of the people involved, well, in fact, the names are quite amusing because the, the preface to, to, to my book begins with a note on names because so many of them had so many names that over uh, sort of marriages and deep old transfers that it's sometimes very difficult to work out what they were calling themselves at particular times. But if I say that the principal lost girls, the four on whom I concentrate, are Barbara Skelton, who I'm sure you've heard of, a woman who in the 1940s was called Janetta Woolley, and then went on to acquire countless surnames, and ended up uh, as a Spanish duchess, uh, Janetta Parley, I think we'll call her here. Uh, Lise Lubbock, who of course for eight or nine years lived with Parley, desperate to marry him, and of course, Sony Brownell, who became the second Mrs. Orwell in 1949. There are some subsidiary people, uh, people like uh, Diana Witherby, she was called in the 1940s, subsequently Diana Cook, who worked on Horizon and became quite a considerable poet in the post war era. Uh, a marvellous woman known as Glur, <laughs> as this third, uh, it was named her stepfather. She was the third Mrs. Cornell, Joyce Warwick Evans, the third Peter Cornell, Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Cornell, known as Glur, because that was the name of her Swiss stepfather, and people thought this was. And, uh, and people like uh, Joe Rayner, who later married uh, Patrick B. Farmer, those are the principal participants in this little clique, all of whom knew one another. And um, the, the things that sociologically connect them are very interesting. Um, they all were associated in one way or another with Horizon. They nearly all had their emotional lives ruined by Sir Connolly. And in fact, one of the things I was able to look at in my research of the book was literally a carrier bag full of letters that Lee Slavik and Diana had written Cyril during the 1940s, which are some of the most pathetic, in the sense of ethos, the sense of the word, um, some of the most pathetic and regretful and not so much resentful as sorrowful sort of post-love affair love letters that you will ever read in your life. Because Connolly, again, as those of you who doubt, I imagine many of you have read up on Connolly, have read some, some of the excellent biographies of him, but, uh, that exist. And Connolly had this extraordinary, A, he had this sort of emotional magnetism, and B, he had this terrible habit of running three women simultaneously and playing one off against another, and then if reproached for this, being absolutely savage about it, saying, how can you treat them like this? He once spoke, he once actually wrote in his diary, and diary I have been, I cannot understand this, I have been faithful to two women for the last three years, and this is how they treat me. So, as I say, most of them, 
had their emotional lives ruined by the only one who seems to have managed to kind of what distinction have to be drawn. The only woman who seems to have not uh, be able to be emotionally embroiled with conflict was Sonia, um, for reasons best known to herself. Probably that she knew too much about it. And the other one, of course, was Barbara Skelton, to whom he was married in the 1950s and led in one hell of a dance. And if you read Barbara Skelton's memoirs, where she's sort of the, the fun that she has with conflict, he was clearly, in a certain sense, not up to her, not up to her fighting weight. And I think that shows in her two volume memoirs. So those were the lost girls. So, uh, as I say, <clears throat> this was, was um, Connolly's factotum, his secretary, Horizon's business manager for seven or eight years during the 1940s. Um, and Janetta, I will get to in a moment. Barbara, he married. Uh, Barbara, I think, was the only one probably who didn't, doesn't seem to come across a lot in the 1940s. But the three of my four who were subjects of this book, which is Janetta, Lys, and Sonia, were in their various ways connected with Orwell and had some very interesting things to say to us about Orwell and his development, both as a writer and as a social being, more importantly, during the 1940s. Um, and so I, I think probably the best thing is if I'm, we go through one, I sort of take you through them one by one while I'm trying to preserve some kind of chronological sample on this. Um, Lise, Lise Lubbock seems to began to be associated with comedy in 1940. One is perhaps the person who knew all well the least, but that doesn't mean that she is not, that she is uninterested in what she has to say about it. Because as um, as probably as factotum is the person who is organising, she's in constant touch with Connolly during the 1940s, especially when he's not actually there. A characteristic of Connolly's behaviour at this time is to him go off, you know, go off on some jolly to Paris in 1945 or to New York in 1947 to fix an American number of rise, and poor Lise would be left back in the office writing the letters, paying the bills and telling what was happening. And um, there are a couple of very interesting letters uh, that turned up in the autumn of 1946, which show the kind of um, uh, kind of missions on which she was engaged on comedies. But oh, so he's gone off, in fact, there's a, there's a letter, I don't quite know where she was, because the letter was actually headed, Hotel Don Teams, Hotel Cap Don Teams on Teams, 22nd, uh, this is the 22nd, of November 1946, and Lisa's faithfully reporting back. Monday, we're having a dinner party here. The Richardsons, Rodney, and Orwell, with Sonia and Lewis Cooks. It should be rather gay. Six days later, Father is coming to lunch tomorrow with the bottle of Algeria. I look forward to seeing him. I'm writing to you too about the dinner party, which was a great success. Orwell was quite gay! Exclamation mark. And I discussed with her too what Orwell was quite gay. She meant that his, his, the symbol that he offered in response was pissed that there you are. <laughs> so, and the other, we also know, one of the, one of the, one of the least tasks in the 1940s was to man, to person, the office. Um, Connolly said, seldom arrived there until after lunch, but at least in Sony, you have to sort of sit there and deal with people who came in. And Lisa's comments on Orwell are rather interesting because uh, he was prone, she says, in the mid-1940s to wander into the office sometimes, to sit there and to complain about Connolly. He would complain about, he would say things like, it's wrong for Cyril to go and accept the invitations to live at the, you know, invitations to have dinner at the Dorchester when, you know, we're in the middle of rationing and half the country is starving. And Lisa, interestingly, thought that this was Orwell's way of flirting. Uh, she said that he, she uttered the cryptic remark that he was much better looking than he seems in his photographs, and that his idea, apparently, sitting there glooming away about uh, Connolly to Connolly's secretary was, in fact, his way of kind of very mildly flirting with him. So, this is interesting. Now, Janetta, Janetta Woolley, as she was at the very beginning of this excursus of this chronology, she suddenly became. Um, she, I think she had six surnames in the end. I'll, 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 let's call her Janetta for the purpose of this. Um, in the latter part, in 1941, Janetta, who was still only a girl of 19, which just shows the kind of racket. Janetta, by the way, was seduced by Connolly at the age of 17 on a trip to France, and when asked why she actually con consented to be pursued by this man, who I suppose was at least twice as old as her uh, at those days, remarked, um, remarked in Oxley, I, I presumed it was what one did. <laughs> Janetta had already had one hell of a life by the time that she virtually sort of set out into the world at the age of 15 by her tremendously sort of hands off, non interfering mother. And Janetta, at the age of 19, was married uh, to a man uh, called Hugh, sometimes known as Humphrey Slater. 
who many of you remember as the social board to institute the Spanish Civil War. Slater did a gallowizer, if that's the correct term, of the uh, International Brigade in Spain in 1937. And come 1941, Janetta, still only age 19, was married to Slater and living uh, in Dorking in Surrey, was coming up to London quite frequently to see her literary friends. And one of the interests and I discovered, Janetta, rather fortuitously from my point of view, died last year at the age of 96, the last of the lost girls, and left this enormous treasure trove of diaries and letters and all kinds of things which her daughters very kindly allowed me to see. And the interest of this volume of Janetta's diary from the early part of 1941, where as I say she's living with Hugh Humphrey Slater down in Surrey, is her imbrication in what might be called the Spanish Civil War veteran side of London literary political life in the early 1940s. Uh, and these are a group of people which Orwell seems to have been intimately involved at this time. And in fact, Hugh Slater and Wintringham were, uh, <coughs> were substantially involved in setting up the Austin Park Home Guard, local defence volunteers um, uh, initiative in the early 1940s. Slater wrote a book about this, which Orwell was sufficiently impressed by to write two reviews of, one in the horizon. And uh, the notes, Orwell's Home Guard street, like street fighting notes that uh, appear in Pete Davis and one of Pete Davis's one, are full of enthusiastic references to Hugh Slater. And you know, the quote Slater here, you know, tell the audience what Slater has to say on this point, that, that sort of thing. And Janetta at this point is married um, to Hugh Slater, although to being Janetta, she had a long, various career of romantic engagement, she's about to dump him for someone else. Um, and Janetta's diaries are full of little references to you know, going up to, she already had, obviously was an intimate friend of Cyril Connolly's, but her diaries from early 1941 are full of references, you know, going up to London, saw Cyril, was supposed to see Orwell, but he didn't turn up, came home, argued with Tom Wintrigan about Orwell, who might be in favour of, but Tom has sometimes has rather a hostile view. Uh, so, we can see Orwell at this point, and it's something, you know, I hadn't quite taken on board myself, which was quite how much Orwell kept up with his own old Spanish Civil War friends, um, acquaintances and people, and how they, they form a genuine little corpus here of, sort of early wartime <coughs> literary and social life. Janetta, very soon, um, there's a marvellous, um, Janetta's great friend of Rafe and Francis Partridge, and features a lot in Francis Partridge's diaries, and there's a wonderful account of her coming back from her wedding to Hugh Slater, this is still at the age of 18 or 19, and saying, an unimportant ceremony which will remain so until such time as I wish for divorce. <laughs> <laughs> this came quite quickly. By, by early 1942, she met a man, again, who some of you deeply versed in Orwell studies will know, she met a man called Kenneth Sinclair Lutet, who had also served in the Spanish Civil War. He left, he temporarily rescinded his Cambridge medicine career to go to Spain in the International Brigade as a doctor in 1936. Uh, he came across to at a party at the Tom and Trimmons in early 1942, and it was what he decides to coup de foudre, a complete sort of immediate sort of attraction between the fact that, you know, that Janetta had a husband, Sinclair Lutet had a wife and child. This was as nothing in the febrile romantic atmosphere of the early part of the Second World War. And pretty soon, she and Sinclair Lutet are living together uh, an address to the sovereign St. John's, uh, somewhere in NW1. And um, the interesting thing about this is that Janetta, of course, is a friend of a friend of a considerable acquaintance of Orwell's, but Orwell, you see, had met Sinclair Lewis in Spain in 1937 and hadn't got on with him at all. This, of course, being because of their different political associations. And um, in fact, there's account, an account in Sinclair Lewis's unpublished memoirs of, um, of the meeting in Spain in 1937 and not getting on at all well. And these, this animosity continued into the early 1940s, and both the Janetta in an unpublished memoir and St. Clair Lutet, in his own version of events, record occasions on which they would go into the West End, in a particular cafe called Majorca, where Orwell could be seen sitting eating a solitary lunch. And he would call them in, or rather he would call Janetta in, while St. Clair Lutet waited on the pavement outside. And she talked to, and he would talk to her, and then they would then sort of go off. And Janetta professed herself not able to understand this, this political animosity, but of course it all goes back to those, those heady days of 1937. In Spain. Now, uh, <clears throat> Janetta and um, Orwell kept up. We can tell this because in 1947, you will doubt, many of you will doubtless know the famous three page letter that Orwell writes to Sonia the day he gets back to Jura in April 
April 1947, and it contains a reference to Ginetta, whose name is misspelled G E N E T T A, I think, or well. So this by the part, of course, when we were talking about the L in the letters last year, we noticed how many times he misspelled her name. You know, what's supposed to be love letters to uh, <coughs> highlight his emotional existence. But anyway, there, are, there is a letter, in fact, which I'm going to <coughs> quote of some of the memoir of hers. And there's a letter suggesting to Sophie that she asked Janetta if she would like to come and bring her daughter to, uh, to Jura, a playmate for little Richard, and this, and this sort of thing. So um, they kept up, and uh, Janetta is... Um, a very important witness, curiously enough, to the last few months of Paul Wells' life. And uh, one of the things that we discovered when uh, rooting around in this enormous collection of papers, um, Genetics Flat, Belgravia Flat, was an unpublished memoir. Now, I had a look at it and was, I think, able to, she was certainly in her early 80s by the time that she wrote it, but that it's no less interesting for what it, she, pretty much her memory is, um, is fairly acute. Um, and so, this is her writing about um, the period of, she, 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 by this time, she'd gone through Sinclair Luther and was married to, or actually married, rather than changing name by default, to Robert Key, the uh, celebrated journalist and um, historian. And so, she says that, um, we staying on the Isle of Wight, Robert was told that Sonny was going to marry George Orwell, so this is August 1949. I was very surprised because I saw a lot of Sonia and she never, she never hinted as to the possibility of marrying. She had described visiting Orwell at a sanatorium, that's Crown, of course, and how gloomy and upsetting it was. Sonia was very good at bothering and taking trouble about people she was fond of. I also knew that Sonia had been having an affair with a French philosopher, that's Maurice Mello Ponty, and it was going unhappily. Then it was autumn in London, Sonia telephoned and asked if we would be witnesses to her marriage. To her marriage, George Orwell had been moved from this sanatorium to UCH, and I went to see him several times. And one of the personal people, um, in fact, one of the few Orwell survivors that, that Jeanette took with her was her daughter Nikki, who was then about five. And Nikki still remembers uh, being sort of taken into the room by her mother, and Orwell looking up from the bed and being sort of terribly kind to her. And sort of, you know, and, and she was trying to, I believe, play with a small car she'd taken with her. And Orwell, Nikki remembers. Um, Nikki is now a woman in her mid-70s, obviously. And she remembers Orwell saying, "No, no, you let her, let her do it, let her play." And, stopping Janetta being cross with her, she'd always, this, this memory had stayed with her over 70 years. So Janetta says, he looked ill and exhausted and preoccupied. I worried that my visits were more of an effort than a pleasure. Before he was so ill, before 1984 was published, he'd invited me to take Nicky up to Jura to keep his little adopted son company. I'd always regretted not being able to do so. He was not an easy man to talk to, being for me in the category of people who silently inhibit one with ever the strong message that anything you say is unbelievably dull and stupid. Cyril Cunnell Connolly, with his silences, was very good at this. When the wedding day came, Ralph and I, sorry, Robert and I went together to the hospital. They were married by a clergyman who came into the room in full clergyman's robes. David Astor was there. He was technically the best man. He stood one side of George's bed, and Robert, who was technically giving Sonia away, who stood her at the other side of the bed. I was the witness. The room was small, looked out onto Gower Street. Apart from two bedside tables, a couple of chairs, a glass, a glass vase near the door, there was no furniture. Possibly one had taken some flowers, but the atmosphere was one of bleakness and touching sadness. I think I had tears in my eyes watching that ill, smiling face. I lingered by the table, fiddling nervously with the bottle of champagne so we had probably put there, in Congress amongst the medical paraphernalia. So, um, that's Janetta witnessing the last sort of last months of, and there's an interest there's a rather interesting courtesy of this which I'll get to at the end of what I have to say. Which takes us back of course to the, the principal last girl, the one whom we know was intimately involved in Orwell for a period of several years. In fact, um, then spent 30 years dealing with the uh, not insubstantial task of administering his legacy, Sonia. Now um, vast Bats of ink have been expended on the question of when they actually met, how they got together. And I remember interviewing, he must have been a very great age, he must have been in his 90s, but I remember interviewing Michael Sayer, the Morwell Chair of Flat at the Northern Road House, in 1935, and Sayer swearing blind that he had introduced them in 1945 after the war and told so that Orwell needed looking after, which was certainly true, even if most of the odds I think are on them having met several years earlier, probably 
uh, again, one of Connolly's dinner parties in, I think, probably around 1941. Uh, and Sonia's memory of this uh, occasion was that Orwell, when the food was put before him, tasted it and said, you put something foreign in the food. <laughs> he said to, to eat it and seemed quite to enjoy himself. And uh, they then, I believe, asked that the copy of his, his book should be sent um, to Sonia. But as um, Celia Goodman, who was then um, Celia Paget again said to me before she he couldn't, given uh, Sonia's proximity to Connolly and Sonia's proximity to Horizon, he couldn't not have known her at that point if he was so intimately involved in Horizon's affairs, which you know that he was. Um, but they then, Sonia, um, even you know, most of the Lost Girls ended up doing war work at some point, so when they, not all of them worked on Horizon all the time, and both Sonia and Lise went off to work in government ministries. But Sonia came back in 1945 uh, to Horizon, where she was given the job of editorial secretary, a, a job she very much enjoyed. She was very much in awe uh, of, of Connolly's intellectual attainments, although in terms of actual liking, I think she probably got on better with Peter Watson, Horizon's proprietor. In fact, Connolly is one supposed to have said, rather ruefully, that if, Cyril, if, the, if Sonia opened the door to him, he knew immediately if Peter Watson was there because 70% of Sonia's smile was reserved for him. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, um, so Sonia, the role of the editorial secretary, is um, uh, reintroduced to the magazine in the autumn of 1945. And Connolly had a policy, Connolly being a very social person, of taking the editorial secretary around to meet his most prominent contributors. So this is why Sonia was taken to the flat at Canterbury Square, which of course Richard. Uh, was by now installed, and um, there and they met. Um, now, Hilary Sperling maintains that uh, they had some kind of brief uh, relationship, the physical side of which is opposed to a Paul Sonia in late 1945, early 1946. Janetta's memory of it is that, in fact, this happened slightly afterwards. And, um, uh, but again, this is a, a lady, a woman in her early 80s, remembering the events of 60 years before, so I'm, I'm not too sure about that. Um, but I suppose that the, the clincher, the crucial, the crucial piece of evidence as to the regard in which Orwell held her is that letter which I uh, previously mentioned, the one written in April 1947 when he came back to Jura. Um, it's interesting because it's obviously he mentions in it that his typewriter is still downstairs. So it's clear that this is um, probably the first letter that he wrote when he got back to Jura to continue with the, the first draft of 1984 was sent to Sonia. Uh, it invites him to visit him. Um, you probably remember that the instructions on how to make what to all well was not a very difficult journey extends to 17 printed lines. <laughs> and, uh, Sonia, of course, never visited the place in his lifetime, and neither, of course, did Janetta. Um, and um, to Hilary Sperling, um, whose work I should say I admire, revere and esteem on Sonia, uh, Sonia that portrait that she wrote <coughs> some years ago, is a wonderful piece of work. To, so to Hilary Sperling, this is conclusive evidence that Sonia is the model of Julia in 1984. And in fact, I think Hilary Sperling does actually use the word recreate uh, and talk about you know, 1984 being a love letter to his mistress in inverted commas. Um, and um, I have to say that having read you know, things have thought about this and <coughs> examined what Orwell actually writes about Sonia in 1984, I'm not 100% convinced that she is. Now, um, several arguments in to propound on this side. One is that um, <coughs> One of them is that Julia is the, just to think about the descriptive language. Um, Julia is described as this sort of very brisk, energetic uh, girl of you know, 26. Sonia at that point was inside of her 29th birthday. Julia isn't at all intellectual. When, you know, that, there's that marvelous, I think very funny scene where they're sitting there in bed and he starts <coughs> reading to her from Emmanuel Goldstein's famous part of the book and turns around and of course she's fallen asleep. So you somehow think that Sonia would actually be more on the case. Sonia, uh, Sonia David, the writer David Plant once remarked to Sonia that it was as if to her man could do nothing more important than to write books. In other words, she was there. She was uh, you know, about to disparage, to describe her as, an, somebody once described her and Janetta as intellectuals and morals, which is sexist, sexist, <laughs> and the point of view of the 1940s, that I'm afraid is what they were. 
And um, then there are the, the actual descriptions of it. There is a description of the first sort of in encounter that they have when they take a journey out of London into the uh, woods. All, of course, always incredibly keen on Sylvan encounters. We were remarking this last year, going through the Eleanor letters, whenever he starts talking about birds nesting, you know there's a glint in his eye. <laughs> <coughs> so, of course, it's not surprising <laughs> that Winston and Julia meet to out in the countryside. But when he did the, 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 the sentence in which he describes her, taking off her clothes and sort of standing there bright and sort of naked in the, in the spring air is very, very close to a sentence that he writes about Eleanor in a letter describing sort of <coughs> bosky trippings through the Suffolk foliage in 1933. <laughs> There's another account where she's described as, um, you know, a swift athletic movement, and, which again reminds us, of course, that Brenda Salkel, another woman son of girls, girlfriends, was a gymnast mm -hmm. taught at St. Felix Girls' School. And in fact, to go even further down this, um, <coughs> down this path, or well, was great friends at this point with um, the writer Innes Holden, uh, who, who did actually come and stay on Jura. And uh, Innes, I think, um, W.J. West worked this out in his um, book, The Lesser Evils, about 35 years ago. There's a wartime novel by Innes Holden called Night Shift, whose heroine is described as being in her 20s and wearing, a <coughs> wearing overalls and a red sash. So I'm not, none of this is conclusive evidence that he wasn't thinking about so but there's also the kind of role that Julia plays in that novel. Now obviously she plays a really important role. She's the she, she's the <coughs> she's the person who sends Winston off into his, his, his act of rebellion. But I would argue that in some ways her role in that novel is figurative. Um, in some ways she's more important for what she represents rather than the person she actually is. We don't really find out that much about what goes on inside her head. And we must also remember, I think very, it, it was, it's possible, possible to speculate that one, one reading of that novel is that Julia is actually the cat's form. The whole thing is a setup that Winston is being enticed into an act of betrayal so that the state can get hold of him and reform him. So in some ways, you know, you could argue that the whole of 1984 is a love letter from Orwell to the girl that he left behind in London. So, you know, on the other hand, <laughs> the other message that it says, the people we love will very probably betray us. So, again, I'm not too sure about this. Um, I think it's possible to have a, a rather equivocal view of well, Sonia's actual role in, in that novel. Now, um, he marries Sonia in 1949. It's the great surprise, of course, of one of his friends, one of the most amusing things of going, going through contemporary reactions to all those wedding. Uh, in October <coughs> 1949 to see what his friends wrote about him. In fact, I discovered a letter of Anthony Poles to an American friend where he said he only actually met Sonia once before the engagement was announced in very bad light. He assumed that she was about 17 and gave her a terrific lecture on classicism and romanticism and all this kind of thing, just to set her right. He was then followed out into the street by an ashen-faced host who said, do you know who you've just been speaking to? And um, and again, people like friends like Malcolm Muggeridge and Julian Simmons were very, very worried by the idea of what had just, you know, Miss Brownlock, the editorial secretary, from Arise and suddenly bringing down, so at that point, such a titanic literary figure as all well. Um, what then happened subsequently, um, and again, I'm, I'm talking here about the Lost Girls in general, and also the specific um, relation to all well, is the Lost Girls have a very interest in the whole, all this, the conjurers, the, the carlers of London literary society during the war began to break up in the late 1940s. <coughs> Rise in itself the last 10 years, probably loses interest, at least leaves him finally, and uh, goes off to do, everybody goes off to do other things, the pact is a leaking figure. Um, the Lost Girls then go on to form a little niche for themselves in post-war British fiction, uh, because Barbara, uh, is, is, is pretty generally accepted is Pamela Woodmanpool in the Dance the Music of Time. Sonia ends up in Dance the Music of Time too as Ada Lightwater, very efficient, brisk, bossy secretary who you know, may or may not be a <coughs> portrait to the life of Sonia. Even more writes about the Lost Girls. Julian Clara Ross writes about the Lost Girls. Nancy Mitford writes about the Horizon Circle and the Blessing. So everywhere they're popping up, making these appearances. But of course, Sonia had reconfigured herself to become what is known in posterity as the widow Orwell. Um, 
according to her defenders, people like uh, Hilary Sperling, um, a wonderful philanthropic sort of custodian of her late husband's memory, and according to people like Francis um, Partridge, just a bossy trunk, you know, who was regularly fall out on the floor at <coughs> dinner parties. But we know that the last period of Sonia's life, when the money, for reasons which I will tell you about in a moment, the money was going, she was living in increasing ill health and was down by poverty in Paris in the late 1970s, were a very difficult time. Um, and one of the things that I discovered in the Janetta Parade archive <coughs> was a letter from Sonia to Janetta, from, sorry, from Janetta to, um, from Sonia to Janetta, written in November 1979, so that's about a year before Sonia dies. And it sheds a great amount of light, I think, both on what had happened to Orwell's millions, if such they were, and also what Sonia thought about attempts, in the use of perpetuating her husband's memory. Anyway, I'll just read you a couple of paragraphs of this. So this is 2nd of November 1979. <clears throat> it seems such a long time since we were in touch, and I'm afraid it's been a horribly long time since my life took such a bad turn for the worse. But I haven't really been able to do much except live in a state of paralyzed horror. It all started in December 1977 when I first began to discover that these Harrisons, who you so rightly mistrusted, had been cheating me for all these years. It's all so amazing and literally terrifying, and even after all this time I can hardly believe it. But the fact is that I'm now involved in a huge, lengthy lawsuit with them, and I'm living in a very distressing world whose existence is quite new to me. It's all very well reading everything in Balzac and Diskins. But it's very bizarre indeed to be actually living the horror. I think old Jack Harrison has gone quite mad, and perhaps he always was, and he's certainly down doing his best to destroy me completely. It's all incredibly complicated, and the law seems to complicate things more with their language and their feeling that time is of no importance. It now appears the case can't be heard till January 1981, such is the congestion in the courts. So I would have been three years in a sort of frozen limbo, but with nothing to do but endure in a sort of steely, stony fashion with little to look forward to because I'm already so tired and feel so old that I don't see anything nice ahead. <clears throat> Actually, I don't see that it was my fault to trust them, although it was clearly my fault to be taken in by them and be so lazy as to rely on them so much. What has added to the horrendous nature of my existence is my fault, I think. I was bullied into commissioning a biography of George because people were writing such bad and stupid ones all around the place. The person I picked, much abetted by the publishers, has turned out to be quite ghastly, incapable of writing properly, bent on somehow needling George and making him out an unpleasant person. I've had endless discussions with the publisher, and it certainly won't emerge as approved by me, but it makes me feel so utterly awful and disloyal and somehow crushes me with an extraordinary sense of futility. I really do so wish I was dead, that I feel I must fight this lawsuit and do my best to get the biography as accurate as possible in a desperate effort to right some of the wrongs I seem to have committed. Now, that is an extraordinary letter because, for a start, well, one thing, the depth of the emotional hurt present in it, I have to say that I don't see what her beef with Bernard Crick was because that biography was a, a trailblazer. Mm -hmm. Whatever you think about it, 30, however many years, nearly 40 years later, the fact is that Crick plowed un untilled fields. Crick untilled, uh, Crick discovered huge corpuses of material nobody else had ever come across, mm -hmm. interviewed every surviving friend of Orwell's he could find, and yet Sonia thought that by allowing that book she would betray her husband's memory. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, she had betrayed it, as she thought again, by the financial crisis that then um, welled up. Of course, she died at the end of 1980 with Crick's biography in the shops and the law suit, which we were suddenly subsequently settled in the state's favour, the law suit pending. So that was, the, that was the end of what, by its final stages, was a very sad existence. But the coda I'd like to leave you with to come to the end of this um, little excursus on the lost girls and their significance in all world studies is that um, Janetta's diary, which I also discovered for the week that Sonia died, said that uh, which is you know, very sorry over this, and said that, you know, with, although Janetta then lived for another uh, 35 years, Janetta remarked, thinking back at those days in the Horizon Circle in the 1940s, with Orwell coming in out of the office and flirting with Lise, and Janetta remarked that a part of me is dying 